guys welcome to my channel hit that like and subscribe button I'm going to explain to you why DEI is necessary this is going to be a robust video when I recorded this video I just clicked record and I started speaking my truth but after going back and listening to it this very very clearly makes a case for why things like diversity and equity and inclusion programs are important um, why affirmative action is necessary. Uh, I think this really lays it out from both a personal detail aspect, my own personal testimony, while, you know, that personal testimony can echo with so many people throughout history uh, across the di African uh, diaspora. But um, also as just um, history, we're just speaking very clearly from a historical aspect, aspect here. And a scientific one as well so uh, if you've been wondering this is why DEI is important if you really just cannot wrap your mind around it or if you are someone who wants to better explain to others why this is so important maybe you could take some nuggets of wisdom from here and also if you just need to hear this maybe this video is for you I also provide some books songs um, and and movies that could uh, be helpful in growing your awareness of these of these these things so um let's take a look at it together hey you guys it is natural welcome back to my channel um something's been on my mind i was talking to a friend you guys know that i'm american but i live in france and uh one thing that happened when i moved to france and not specifically when i started traveling around europe but specifically moving to france i met so many of my African sisters and brothers. I talk about it a lot on this channel. And um, it really just, it connected me with my spirit. It connected with something very visceral and innate with me. And it's not just that, this is also just like one of my soul sisters. In a lifetime, sometimes you meet those friends and it just, you click it off immediately, you know? And um, we were talking, she's black of course, and um, she came over for brunch and something happens when black people, especially black women, get together. And you guys, this is not to exclude anyone. I feel like it's absolutely ridiculous that in 2023, we have to caveat these kinds of sentences by saying, I'm not doing this to exclude anyone. You know, we are nothing but our culture. Um, we all come from the same place, which is Africa very quite simply put you know like people traveled out of Africa over millennia and evolved into the races that we have today but um anyway that's just a caveat to say that this isn't exclusionary towards anyone shouldn't have to say that but whatevs and um something happens when black women get together it's just you can speak almost without words you can finish each other's sentences the love is already there there are no awkward spaces there is no let me think strategically about what it is that i want to say for fear of someone using some information against me now of course there are black people that do that um that's another story for another day i mean if you would ask certain Southern black folks, those types of black, black folks come from a certain type of pathology, if you get my drift. But um, when you just get around your soul sister or your soul brother, there's no self-editing, you know? There's no, um, oh, well, let me just think of the best way to frame how I'm gonna say this because, you know, maybe they'll go and use this against me or maybe they'll, Maybe they'll go and you. There's no like, let me think of the best way to say this because maybe they'll use this against me and, you know, go and smear me to a mutual friend or anything like that. It's literally just, it's free. We were talking and, um, we were talking about her job and right now is a very pointed moment 
in society across the Western world, but globally, all over the world, where black people, doesn't matter if they speak all these languages that we speak, you know, because of slavery, doesn't matter if they speak French, English, Portuguese, Spanish, German, you know, all over the world, people are getting squeezed out of the room. Black people are getting squeezed out of the room. And it shouldn't surprise us. But um, I'm going to get into that in another video. But she was telling me, um, I just got to find another job. You know, she was like, I just got to find another job because I don't know. I just feel suffocated. I, I was so happy when I first got there. But, you know, it's just. And I feel like my every move is being observed and, you know, like I just feel suffocated. And she just kept kind of reiterating how happy she was when she first got there. And I'm kind of like preparing an omelet <laughs> while I'm talking to my friend. Because, of course, I'm always just like behind on stuff. In, in America, we call it black, we call it um, CP time, colored people time. Africans call it African people time. <laughs> black people time doesn't even matter but same stuff um when your when your pathology from your evolution is like oh it's just like chill out in the sun <laughs> it really wasn't our structures that created like if you don't be on this time frame you are a failure and even in parts of africa meetings sometimes don't start until like an hour or two after they're supposed to because people sort of like check in with each other see how they're doing but anyway um, that's not everywhere, you know, of course it's cultural, but as I'm making this omelet and I'm listening to her talk and stuff, I'm like, you were so happy there when you first got there, but maybe you were afraid to say the wrong thing, or maybe somehow you couldn't really pinpoint it or put your finger on it, but you kind of just felt on edge. You kind of felt like you were walking on eggshells. She was like, yeah, I did. Well, I mean, the astonishment doesn't surprise me because about seven or eight years ago, I figured out that corporate America was just not for me. Like, it just wasn't for me. But I still work within the binds of corporate America. I still work within the bounds of corporate America. I just do it as a freelancer. I just do it as my own business owner. So... I don't have to go into an office every day. Now, that's saying that's not saying I've got at least 30 more years of my career. I mean, I hope that I will retire early, but I actually like what I do. So I hope that I have 30 years. Um, but I knew at some point, like, I could not keep dealing with the silly office politics. And after about... <laughs> the seventh or eighth time that it happened where usually less melanated people started off to be very, very nice. And then that morphed into like data collecting. Like it wasn't really, the conversations weren't really to get to know me. It was more like data collecting, you know? And then that morphed into passive aggressive behavior of course all unwarranted you know I'm not saying that my ish doesn't stink or that I'm perfect but it's very clear to see that some certain very 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 qualified black people with wonderful personalities amazing you know sets of respect for you know how they treat their other office colleagues you know they could tick all the boxes 10 times over but yet they may still be held to a higher standard than some people who are far less qualified, much more, you know, um, inclined to be sort of lethargic and apathetic towards work ethic or deadlines. Um, but those may be the people that often get to sit in the room, you know, get to really reap the benefits. And... Um, there was just at some point where I realized, wow, some patterns are happening here. Some patterns are happening here. Um, and usually that pattern somehow involved white women. Um, 
this is something that's really bizarre to me that people today want to act as if racism doesn't exist slavery was a long time ago there's no need to talk about it anymore there's no way that the implications of those days way back then still have a place in our society today it's absolutely just bizarre to me um and it's bizarre to me that white supremacy and I'm not talking about the marching out in the streets, you know, you will not replace us, white supremacy. I'm talking about manifest destiny. I'm talking about the transition of power from generation to generation through bloodlines of monarchies, of fascist rulers. I'm talking about the Holy Roman Empire, the, the Crusades. I'm talking about the Ottoman Empire. I'm talking about... Um, the transatlantic slave trade <laughs> you know i'm talking about mass production and industrialization i'm talking about the civil war you know i'm talking about this technological age that we've been thrust in the middle of which none of us really asked for i'm talking about that you have to go back to that point of like for the longest people we're just like black or brown in terms of the races we've defined today of course nobody is black and nobody's white but going back ages like millennia people look basically african because they are african they were african and they are african we come from africa and about eight thousand years ago people started turning white because of adaptation evolution climates some other factors, people's skin started getting less melanated and their hair got straighter, their eyes got lighter and therefore the race that has dominated over other races kind of rewrote history. You know, if I ask you right now, where did the guitar come from? You know, what, who invented the guitar? you would say, oh, it had to be the Europeans. If I asked you who invented science, where did science come from? You, your brain would want to tell you, yeah, that definitely had to come from, I don't know, some, some period in the European, you know, history, the, the great enlightenment, um, Baroque period, Renaissance, something like that, I guess, I don't know. If I ask you, where was music invented? You say, it had to be Europe, right? If I ask you about art, it had to be Europe. If I ask you about medicine, it had to be Europe. It had to be Europe. But Europe wasn't the first place on the earth to be, to be populated. It wasn't the first place where civilization was grown. And I can tell you firsthand that art history which I studied in university as my minor, given. Art history, even some of the whitest, lily white, wonder bread, whitest, whitest teachers that I've ever had, love them dearly, said to us straight, candidly forward, the art history world, the academia world, will try to just define Africa as Egypt. Like there's no other part of Africa that existed. Because... That white supremacy that's dominated the past 8,000 or odd years wants you to believe that the people who were a little bit lighter, a little bit closer to looking European, were the smart ones in Africa. But the dark ones, they didn't really give us any contributions to medicine, to science, to music, you know, to literature, to art. They didn't, re they didn't really give us any contributions. But it's all bull hooky. We all come from Africa. You know, right there. And it's definitely not up north. It's down towards the south on the east side. And then that kind of spurred it out into all the places that we know now. So, I guess with saying all that, 
it just doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me. And um, when I had those moments where all of a sudden it just seemed like some white woman who started out really, really nice just started to pick me apart and flail me and flip me over and grill me and turn me and, um, you know, it lost me friends, it lost me job opportunities, it lost me opportunities in university, undergrad and, you know, post-undergrad. Lost me, you know, professional opportunities, social opportunities four and five and six and seven and eight and nine and ten times is happening and, you know and probably about the first six or seven times honestly I grew up in a pre-Trump world <laughs> where the world was actually trying to make some progress on this stuff and it wasn't as pugilistic and so I really did not just I didn't experience overt or covert racism to this degree and to this frequency before 2015 you know pretty easy upbringing even if I was from the south even if I grew up in the south I just I don't know I, I also went to a selection of good schools tried to keep my head down do my work um, develop my interest which is art and um, yeah but then Again, after four and five and six and seven and eight and nine, ten of times of these things happening. And there would be usually a man at the top, uh, a white man at the top. But it was white women who had a certain amount of sway over this white man, you know, who kind of, I, like I said, it's that, it's that, it's that journey of coming from being really nice seeming to recognize my talent seeming to recognize my skill and competence um and my unique contribution to data collecting to passive aggressive behavior to microaggression to i'm out of social professional friendship you know, uh, you know, academic opportunities all of a sudden. And so by the eighth or ninth time, I had to do a little bit of research. And I actually came upon this video that talked about how white women own 40% of the slaves, in America at least. But, I mean, you also have to apply this lens to Western Europe. I mean, Western Europe had its slaves as well. They might have been offshore in places like Haiti. I'm trying to say that in the French way. Haiti. It still probably sucks. Haiti. Jamaica. Uh, Cabo Verde. But um, they still existed. And I think about that. At least in America, 40% of the slaves were owned by white women. And we know there's a very sordid history of white women crying wolf and black people becoming martyrs, lynchings. A woman could just not even tell the truth and say that someone whistled at her and suddenly a child is being hung from a tree. And that was very commonplace. It was very commonplace for white women to black men. I know that that's hard, it's difficult to hear, and it's touchy, but it relates to where we are societally today. And again, keep this in context that white supremacy, white people in general, they really didn't spring up in large numbers until about 8,000 years ago while the human race is two million years old and born of Africa. White women would give birth to babies and black women were expected to wet nurse them. 
they were expected to raise them. And I got all this information from this video, which was lovely. The only thing that ruined it was this guy was talking about red pill and stuck in this red pill notion. And I really wish that people would just see themselves as education seekers and stop putting themselves in labels of red pill, um, MAGA, um, Antifa, feminist even, you know, just be a knowledge seeker and seek out the truth, the real truth. Um, but otherwise, the video was lovely. I couldn't watch the whole thing because there was a whole bunch of crazy red pill talk in it. But um, he did give pure facts about this prevalence throughout history of white women to having been almost as brutal as white men. And um, white women with black women, as I was saying earlier, would have them wet nurse their children, really raise their children. Um, even if they were fit, completely fit to take care of their children, they saw that as lowly work. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna breastfeed my kids like I'm a slave. You know, that's what they saw as caring for their children as like, ugh, I'm not gonna do the slave labor. And you might see some of that prevalence today, just trying to link up these things so it really clicks for you. Just trying to link up some of those preconceived notions and biases that we have today, where you know black women may try to penetrate into those areas of um, executive leadership, into science, into biotechnology, into uh, space, to aeronautics, into engineering, into coding, into film, into television, to creative arts, into entertainment, into radio, into television, into government, you know, and there might be people out there that really just look at that qualified black woman and essentially say, you know, you don't want to come into this domain, do you? You'd be much better off working at a daycare. There is a reason for that stereotype. It comes from somewhere. There also would be this thing where, you know, white women would black men. Um, they would hold things over them. And these were slave owners. So very clearly, these were, these were women. They could not own land, but they could own slaves. And so they essentially saw black men as sexual objects. I know that's a little bit strange because we often think of um, women usually as being objectified. Um, and I think that also translates into something today. I, I'm not quite sure how to label it. The, the, the red pill guy that I watched, and I can't remember his name, I'm sorry, but um, he referenced, for instance, you know, how there's a lot of interracial dating prevalent in sports relationships, like, you know, football players, basketball players, men who are African American or black, and, you know, marrying white women Caucasian, European descent, however you want to call it. And then um, once he retires, them going away, which I don't completely, I, I, I'm a type of person where I kind of like to see like statistics and I like to read up on this. Um, I'm going to give you guys a few books that, that might be helpful to you that have been helpful to me in looking into all of this because I know some people just don't want to take black people's word for it, you know? This is information that's been passed down, not only in our DNA, but literally from oral tradition, you know. I feel like our ancestors, our parents, our grandparents, our aunts, our uncles, no matter whether you're African American, uh, a black person in Britain, a black person in Nairobi, you know, it's like, yeah. You guys don't understand the extent of this. Your family will not let you forget because it, it's real. Um, I'm, of course, speaking mostly in my background, so the African-American context. So the books that I will give you will be likely mostly from African-Americans. But, um, you know, if, if there are some people who doubt what I'm saying, and sometimes it's bizarre because people really only want to hear it from the lips of a white person, and then they hear it from a white person, and they're like, oh, you're just being sensational 
8,000 years, y'all. But anyway, um, the guy in the, the red pill video, he's speaking on this, and he gives this example of the sports people with, you know, white wives, interracial relationships there. And I wouldn't go so far as to use that reference. I would almost go more so towards entertainment. You know, there is something with black men in entertainment where they're often sexualized. I don't know if you guys noticed this, but <laughs> I mean, there was, in general, if you look back to the, the age of our parents, you know, at least, I mean, I'm 32, so if you look back to the age of the 60s and the 50s, 60s, and 70s, um, it was much more wholesome in general, maybe less in the 70s, but, um, you know, for instance, in the African-American community, those black artists that did cross over, the Sammy Davis Juniors, the Temptations, Otis Redding, there was definitely an appeal to these men, and they were definitely marketed from whoever their marketers were. They were definitely marketed in a way that was like, um, how do you want to say, um, capitalizing on their appeal, on their swagger, you know, their sexuality in a subtle way. But it definitely wasn't like our Chris Browns, our Ushers, love Usher, by the way, really excited that he's going to be in the Super Bowl. Um, but still, you guys understand what I'm talking about, this, this element of like, you've got to take off your shirt and show us the goods, which, you know... Okay, I get it. I watch Channing Tatum movies. It's not like it's just black men that that happens to. But what I'm just saying is like, sometimes it seems like the only way for black men also to make it in entertainment is if they're willing to strip down their clothes. And it seems like women also, black women also run into the same things, you know. So you have that translation sort of from the slavery type thing of white women sort of using black men as sexual objects um both white men white slave owners and uh both white men male slave owners and white female slave slave owners <laughs> really taxing to get that sentence out both of them white slave owners men and women would black men and women okay i mean rampant rape rampant incest um, black women sometimes, well, I mean, oftentimes, honestly, were forbid, forbade by white female slave owners from sleeping with certain types of people, even potentially their own husbands. A white female slave owner could say, oh, you're knocking those babies out like clockwork, you know. How are you going to be able to run my bath every day? You know, you guys can't. No, no more of that. Done between you two. Uh, white female slave owners were oftentimes responsible for breaking families apart, you know. And I'm not just talking about, like, the color purple type thing where two almost grown-age sisters are separated. But, like, a mother from a, a just-born baby, a mother from a three-year-old child, a husband from his newlywed wife. Could you imagine that? Um... Could you imagine like four or five hundred years of that? Um, they would sort of take the black woman often as well, right after giving birth to a baby and say, you need to come in the big house and work for me. Really no time for recovery. And at this time, medicine was not what it was. So childbirth was probably really, really almost, I mean, the, I can't imagine what the mortality rate was. Um, but still, black women had to just sort of sit their pain aside and also sit, you know, their nursing aside. I'm pretty sure their nursing kind of came into the matter because as you guys probably know, when you first have a child, that child actually has glands. You have glands and they're connected, you know, through hormones. When that baby needs feeding, even if the mother is like 
10, 20, 30 feet away, she might start leaking. You know, it's like that baby needs to be nursed by their mother and newborn babies need to be nursed like every 13 minutes or something. So imagine that a woman being pulled from her baby and imagine that again for four or 500 years. And all of this when African tradition going back and back and back in history with the exclusion of like the Moors maybe, black people weren't trying to colonize all of Europe. You've never ever seen that. And even in this day and age where black people and I, I honestly think this is why you witness so much kin and Karen behavior, why you witness so much dehumanizing and scheming and plotting and data collecting and microaggressions and micromanagement and pushing people out of rooms, um, the shooting of pe black men, you know, by police, the police brutality, the the doctors not really showing black women in the hospital the same due presence and diligence, you know, sort of just fluffing and slushing off their illnesses, you know, and dismissing their illnesses almost to a fatality, you know, sometimes. The issue of, of you know, just all of these atrocities, these injustices that are waged against black people every single day. I honestly think they're quite, quite linked to the fact that white people are terrified, terrified that we're going to do the same thing. But the older that I get, you know, and I'm not done learning, I'm just a learner. That's what they call students in Africa. Some parts, they call them learners instead of students, and I really like that. I'm not done learning, but I do think something that I've learned along the way is that black people can really almost look at these certain subsect of individuals of white people who use their, wield their whiteness as a weapon and the systems that wield whiteness as a weapon. Um, our MO has never really been violence, not on a massive scale. And you can look at those rogue ones like, you know, uh, what was the um, African dictator? I'll put his name up somewhere around here if I can remember. Um, that wasn't really their MO. You know, that was a result of the colonizer mentality. And it's when the colonized takes on the colonizer mentality. But y'all, for the most part, if you want to look at African history, we just been chilling. And I have a song that I want to reference in just a second to um, verbalize that. It is a reggae song. And I'm not into reggae culture. I don't smoke drugs or anything like that. But... I feel I've always had a love of reggae music. My mom, when I was young, used to play Bob Marley a lot. And I think that started it off, Bob Marley and the Wailers. And uh, if you want to look for some music that really talks about revolution, that really talks about the struggle and oppression and puts it into context of today that doesn't forget about the past. Right now, there's a concerted effort in America to make black music abandon the past. In the 50s and the 60s, it wasn't quite so abandoned. You'll still find that in gospel, but in mainstream music, it seems like, hey, they don't want us to talk about oppression, so we won't talk about it. And it's really arrogant to assume, you know, for these systems where they wield whiteness to say, slavery was so long ago. Why do you even want to talk about it? because it still affects us today and it affects white people as well. When you look at a race, a group of people that suffer so much from depression, from suicide, from drug abuse, from addiction, from domestic terrorism, school shootings, it's not just affected black people. We are oppressed and that wielded whiteness 
is oppressing itself because it will not accept the past. And if you don't accept the past, you don't know where you're going. And if you don't know where you're, where you're going, yeah, that ends up in depression. That ends up in not being fulfilled in yourself. And you can pile yourself up with all of these material things, but something inside you will still be broken. White people need a spiritual renewal. Black people's spiritual renewal is like ongoing, baby. Like each generation makes sure that it's ongoing. This generation is, you know, it's coming to a harsh wake up call. Because like I said, I didn't experience this. My, my family and my mom and my dad and my granddad and the elders in my community, they talked about it a lot. But me and my sisters and brothers and my cousins... You know, most of us just were like, Ugh, our world's not like that anymore. Both me and my cousin, we both marry white guys. Because it just races, despite the way that the world right is right now, it wasn't a barrier to love, you know. And even taking adults out of the context, when you look at young children, they can be all together, Hispanic, white, black, Asian, Indian, Native American, uh, Eskimos, whatever you put, you know, children, if you put them together, they just play. And it's not that they don't see race, they see it, but it doesn't hold them back. Um, but anyway, reggae is wonderful to just kind of think on this stuff. Remember that it existed. You cannot just say, Dude, you, want, you don't want to be judged on your, your ancestors, and I don't want to be judged on mine, so let's just move on. No. No, 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 because it still has an effect, and it's going to have effect for thousands and thousands and thousands of years to come. But I think, as I was saying, as I've gotten older, I've come to think of it as, say you're a parent. <laughs> a parent or just an adult who is you know, care, caregiving for child. And that child is throwing a tantrum. Now, that child is younger than you. They're less mature than you. They've just been around on this earth. They've walked this earth, this earth a little less time than you. And their anger is real. Maybe their anger is even valid, you know. But... What they don't understand is what they're doing with that anger is not valid. They don't understand and they haven't gotten to the point to understand that they shouldn't use that anger to hurt others. But let's just say in that moment that that child is angry and they start throwing things. And let's say it hits the adult. And let's just say it's so grave that something like I don't know, the child was angry and so they threw their toy right near the person and they were near the, sta the stairs and they slipped on that toy and fell down the stairs and paralyzed themselves for life. Or let's just say the child was so angry and they had a sharp object and threw it or, you know, swung it some way and it ripped a certain nerve and that person um, almost bled to death, you know. Um... Lots of things, you know, let's just say, and I know that that's a big hypothetical, but I just, I paint that picture to say that's a kind of a bit what I feel like the responsibility of the African diaspora is with this, this weaponization of whiteness. Because again, whiteness has only stemmed up in the last 8,000 years, but white supremacy has made it where it said... You know, who do you think invented science? Who do you think invented civilization? Who do you think invented music? Who do you think invented modern philosophy? And all of those questions, white supremacy has swayed you to believe they all must have came out of Europe. But in our two million year journey as human beings, what we define as white only stemmed up about 8,000 years ago. And I think, like I said, that weaponization of anger, fear, microaggression, karenicity, kin, whatever you want to call it, I think it's that inherent fear that, that we're going to do to them 
what they did to us. But when you're that parent or that that caretaker of that child, you I mean, even if that child push you down the stairs, what are you going to do? You're going to hold it against that child forever? You'll always remember, but they weren't in their right mindset when they did that. So, I mean, most adults in their sane mind, <laughs> insanity really comes into this too, but most adults in their sane mind wouldn't retaliate on that child. Most adults in their sane mind would say, okay, you are limited to your capacity, to your capacity of thinking, of being evolved, and so I can't really hold it too much against you. And even take the, the dire circumstances out of it. Even if the child didn't sever a nerve or push that adult down the stairs, but even if the adult just got scratched by the child or hit, you know, um, we could maybe call those the microaggressions in the office or, you know, the mean mugging on the bus or whatever it is, you know, didn't really like paralyze you for life, but it hurt, it stung. Um, I, I wish that white people in general can understand that black people can't let this go and it, it won't be let go. You know, it still tugs on us today. And it's, it's absolutely bizarre. No one should be speaking for us. No one should be speaking for us in the form of a blackish type sitcom. No one should be speaking for us in terms of uh, a fox soul. <laughs> you know, it's like, just let us speak for us. Because this mentality of like, slavery was so long ago. We want to help you just get over it. It's like, no, how about you help yourself get over it? Look at the suicide rates. Look at the homicide rates of mass shooters. Help yourself get over it, please, for the sake of all of us. And look at the rate at which the, the planet is being destroyed. You cannot oppress forever. But what would happen? I mean, black people, it's not our MO. I mean, flip back through history and on massive scales, our MO has never ever been to colonize Europe. And I don't think it ever will be. It's just not in our DNA. Now again, you get some people, they've got thwarted into that colonizer pathology. And so yeah, maybe they will. But that'll be on a circumstance, an era, a, a leader basis, an individual basis. But for the most part, I don't think you'll ever find that. I think instead of weaponized whiteness, looking for black people to correct and data collect and observe and squeeze out push in push back out order to go over there go over there come back over here i think what will be better is for those who call themselves white or for those who like society has labeled as white look inside look inside and see how generational trauma has maybe hit your family you got some alcoholics in your family. You got some people addicted to pills in your family. You got depression that runs in your family. Do you have cancer that runs in your family? Look at that from a spiritual perspective. And know that we all come from Africa. It's where we, are, we all started. And it's swinging right back around to it, you know? The world is not majority white. And it never has been. But the power dominance has always been there. There's a reason why the Neanderthals died out. I mean, they mostly just got wiped on out. Some of their DNA came here, but I definitely have an innate feeling that somewhere between the Australopithecus and Neanderthal, that's kind of where that race kind of thing started to spring up. And I think that the Neanderthals, there's a reason why whites and Asians have the most Neanderthal DNA. I don't think that the Homo sapiens killed off the, the Neanderthals. I think that they were so rudimentary in their look of the world. And they had a fear, an aggressive fear, that made them hide in caves. And in the end, that wasn't what saved them from the environmental changes that was coming. You know, what saved our ancestors from this time 
was collaboration, was coming together. It was not isolation, but the Neanderthals isolated themselves and fear and aggression. I feel like white people, I'm looking at all this craziness going on back in my home country, like in Texas, where they're trying to outlaw abortion. I look at how these these authoritarian leaders have recently put out statements telling women to have eight and nine babies. There's such a concerted effort right now to eviscerate people of color off the planet and to produce more white and Asian babies in certain sense, certain circumstances. And um, I get it. I get it. But I think that effort would be better exerted and trying less to insert people's ideologies into other people's lives and it would be more well equipped to think about how can you work together you know how can you come together and to also think about what I what I spoke of um, generational trauma how that trauma has hit Neanderthal I mean it's like they didn't even have a chance they um I feel like they encountered these new peoples the predecessors of homo sapiens or homo sapiens themselves and or something in between and I think some of them had the inclination to um, be curious about them, but I feel like the most part, there was probably deep fear rooted in that. That isolation, even if you just try to make women just crank out babies, usually the opposite is going to happen. When you talk about culture and passing down your old tradition, I mean... For black folks, I mean, that comes down to, for example, the Korah. The Korah is an old, ancient African. I'm sorry, not the Korah, but the Oud. I think you call it Oud. Oud. It's basically like a lute. It's like an older uh, version of a lute. And it's been around since like 2000 BC. And the lute, in some ways, can be called the predecessor of all the string type instruments like the guitar, the violin, um, the harp, it comes from Africa. Um, black people sit down and we talk about these things. We talk about it takes a village to raise a child. That's not just a saying, it's an old African adage. We talk about Matambu, we talk about um, the Asante tribe, we talk about Timbuktu. Like, we talk about even up to stuff like, you know, in, in the African-American home, things like uh, James Baldwin and, and um, W.B. Du Bois and uh, Booker T. Washington. We talk about African folk tales. Go and talk about, you know, those European folk tales that you love. Talk about, you know, European traditional music that came out of, you know, the second and, and first century AD, uh, BC, that came out of the Renaissance, that came out of the Baroque period, that came out of the medieval times. Talk about um, customary European clothing, you know, uh, ceremonial and traditional clothing. Talk about family structures of your culture. European or Asian, you know, but get out of the habit of just saying, you woman, you need to have eight, nine babies. I mean, no one is ever going to budge that way. And the deeper that you go into authoritarianism, and this is on that like whiteness weaponized on an institutional level, but also on an individual level, you'll eventually just self-destruct. I think that's how this ends. That's how it ended for Neanderthal. And then whiteness just basically had to like put itself into place to kind of just survive for long enough to come into 
dominance again. The next time they came into dominance, it was quite, quite disastrous. And it ended in the transatlantic slave trade. But, I mean, white supremacy. And yes, I'm lumping Karens at work demonizing black women for absolutely nothing under white supremacy. Think about those slave owners, those female slave owners who wanted to hang on to that status, you know, that status. It's like Gucci purses today, slaves back then. But it eventually leads to self-destruction. And we can't just get over it. No, we're going to have to talk about this for a while, you know. Let me read these lyrics to you guys. Otherwise, I would be sitting here talking all day. It probably just explains everything that I just took 40 minutes to say in a short, sweet, beautiful package. So let me just pull this up to you. It just came into my... It came into my um, queue. Now, I do not speak Patois. So, I think it's Patois. So, please don't judge me on my terrible pronunciation of this. But, I'm going to try to read this to you guys. So, this is called Boss Man from Luton Fire. So, it says, Want a piece of this? Yeah, yeah, yes. Want a piece of this? You need a little piece of food. Figo Massa work. I got a few bills to pay makes matters worse. In a pawn away, me jewel a bank, a rob a de purse, jano. So basically he's saying here, you know, you got to get some food. He's got bills to pay, but that makes matters worse. You know, he's going to go to master to work. He's got bills to pay, and that makes matters worse. He's like, what do you want me to do? You want me to... um pawn my jewel or rob a bank or a purse so it goes on to say so boss man give me what my, give me what me come for stop beat around the bush you now see me frustrated and I yuts are they fee hunger like how it how it look so boss man give me what I come give me what me come for Stop beat around the bush. You now see me frustrated. A yada yuts, they fee hunger. So I, I guess he's basically saying, um, boss man, give me what I come for, which is the money to pay for my food, to, to, to feed me, to feed myself. Don't you see that I'm frustrated? You know, give me what I come for. It's just basically like, you know, talk doesn't feed me, doesn't put food on the table. So, uh, like how it look, say me na, stretch me hands out, for na hand out, me na come na, ya na see sa, there's a drought, and I yes, they need food to their mouth. Don't you see, there's a drought, they need food to their mouth. Too much hungry belly picking in their bones, and they tell me, be serious, I want the right amount, you boss man. Gimme me boss man. Me no get me cross man. Stop treat the ya like orphan. Stop treat the youths. Okay. So when he says, y I, I've been saying yes, I forgot. It's youths. Like youths. Stop treat the youths like orphan. Man a walk in a home ye banned from. So then he goes back into the chorus again. And then he goes and he says, like how it look, humiliated. So them cheat, we oughta them make it rough. No dough to we bucket, so we style, we a scruff. Full time, me feel wasted. Me still keep it conscious. Me duddy tough, ja no me na bluff. So right here he's essentially saying, I feel exhausted, I'm working so hard but it has no fruition, I think. But a one thing me no say me born suffering. Hey, sick and tired of the ghetto struggling. Say it hard, but yet we still working. Now we know that the ghetto was created um, as a result of white supremacy. 
there was, I'm sorry, but there was no ghetto before. <laughs> Again, it's just not, it's not an African pathology. Um, we come from tribalism, which is really about symbiosis. Um, I mean, we invented bartering. <laughs> like, we just want to, we want to help each other out. Again, I'm not talking about individuals. Of course, there's, there's bad ones in there. So he goes into the course again. Like how it look, two weeks, we not get no pay in a fortnight. The boss, the boss signed the check. Supervisor say, I'm never come in time. So boss man, give me what he come for. Stop beating around the bush. Hmm. So there's another one. Um... Now listen to this. This is, I love Mortimer. So this is Mortimer, and it's entitled Fight the Fight. So he says, Ja, give I courage to fight the fight. Now, of course, fight is symbolically. Historically, black people don't fight with their fists. They fight with their minds. Now, of course, there are tribes that feuded. I'm talking about a fight of trying to colonize the entirety of a race. That's really Europeans game. It has not historically been black people's game. And yes, I think there are people out there who treat black and brown people horribly because they think if we had the chance that we would do the same to them. But no, nah, I don't think that's really in our book. We just want respect. So fight is definitely symbolic. It's symbolic of fight the fight with your spirit and your mind to transcend and to be aware. So it says, Ja, I give courage to fight the fight. I know they might try to conquer our Lord God. Guide I by day and watch I by night, Lord. I pray you'll restore your people's sight, Lord God. Ja, give I courage to fight the fight, cause to fight the fight. I know they might try to conquer I, conquer I. So I'm going to pause there. Like, I thought the word conquer was so incredibly unique and peculiar and interesting of a choice of word to use because when you think of conquer, you think of a battle. You know, you think of someone trying to quite literally disarm someone and dominate them and beat them into compliance, you know, and sort of make them your casualty of war to put up your flag and say that you conquered a land um and he's talking about these forces that will try to conquer what seems like him but also a larger meaning a larger movement a larger people which of course can be the tyranny of white supremacy against black and brown peoples so he goes on to say, guide I by day and watch I by night, Lord. I know you'll restore your people's sight, God. I man crying for peace and justice. I man rather to die than to kneel, rather to die than to kneel. I see oppressors sitting on their thrones, trying to dictate the price of my soul. Pause there, you know, if you're black out there. How many times have you felt like you quite literally had to sell your soul a little bit to get your paycheck. And whether that selling your soul came in the form of maybe you had to engage in a little gossip, throw somebody under the bus, maybe it came into the form of you went out on the date with your sleazy boss and you really didn't want to. Maybe it came in the form of, you know, you even just kind of watering down your intellect, maybe you had an employer or a colleague or a boss or whatever it might be who, or teacher who really wanted you to dial down your intelligence in order to make them look better. In many ways, you know, those are just a few examples, but I'm sure some of you all have encountered that. Um, so it says, I see oppressors sitting on their throne trying to dictate the price of my soul. Ja, I give courage to fight that fight. Ja, I give courage to fight the fight. I know they might try to conquer I, conquer I. Why? 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 <laughs> Sorry, this is where I'm like, what? Why? 
God eye by day. Oh, what? I think that's why I got just a noise. <laughs> God eye by day and watch eye by night. Day by, by day, oh by night. I pray you'll restore your people's sight. That right there is given, like, you know, coming back from where I started from, talking about my friend. There's something with the Africa. There's something with the African diaspora where there's such a connection, you know, like the old slave hymns and um, stories of the Underground Railroad of Africans who had been brought to America, who were so desperately trying to be reunited with their family members that had been torn away from them, from them, their traditions from back home in Africa that had been torn away from them. Harriet Tubman was like, I'm not taking this crap anymore. And she built the Underground Railroad. The thing that guided them in the dead of the night, you know, these dogs, these vicious dogs barking in the night, flashlights searching them out, they're just trying to escape to freedom. What guided them? It was the North Star. That was the light in the dark. I think of that song, Wade in the Water. You know, that is very real. It's very real. And I think many people who claim that I'm not racist, many people who claim this is not about race, many people who claim let's not talk about race, many people who claim I don't see race, many people who claim you wouldn't want to be judged by your ancestors, why should I be judged by mine? I don't think they really sat down and grasped what would it feel like if every day in 2023 I walked around with a target on my back and that my ancestors had to just sort of grapple with beatings and rapings and um, being separated with their own children, their family members, until one day they could sneak off barefoot with dogs chasing them, waiting in the water all night. You know, to just go, just to be free. I don't think people have sat to thought, think about that and how it affects us today. Um, through soul and conscious, fire burns within, fire burns within. Light inspires change. I won't fall victim, won't fall victim. Jog give by courage to fight the fight. We gonna fight the fight. Um, I know they might try to conquer. We're going to fight the fight. Why? Guide eye by day and watch eye by night. We're going to fight the fight. I pray you'll restore your people's sight. We're going to fight the fight. Natty got to be firm and strong. You know, Natty is a, is a term that not just Jamaican people, but many people use to describe the texture of black people's hair, specifically when talking about dreadlocks. And so it basically, I think, is a variation of the term nappy. And, you know, like, like sheep's wool, you know, hair like sheep's wool. That's what's coming to my mind. But it's that feeling of people of the African diaspora. We, we just have to stick together. In this time of hatred and greed, selfishness at its highest jaw. But my soul will never be sold. So jaw just means God. But my soul will never be sold. Jah loves stronger than any weapon. Than any weapon. You know, the next time someone looks at you just because you're black and thinks that you were violent, think that they need to clutch onto their purse, you know, kind of like protect themselves around you. They're creating some narrative in their head that you're a thug and you're just like, dude, what's going on? You know, just remember that there is a bigger thing going on here. Keep yourself safe, you know, but remember who you are. Bad intention and scheme. Baba da beep bop. <laughs> it literally says Baba da beep bop. We've lost love for self and don't know how to proceed. You, when I just talked about these higher rates of depression, addiction to pills, alcoholism, sh school shootings. That is a deep. That is the deepest lack of self love that I've, I, I could think to imagine. Jaw give I courage to fight the fight. We gonna fight the fight. And and now that I think of it, white supremacy in itself is a lack of self love. You know, when you quite literally have to beat that you're the best down someone's throat. I mean, does it really mean that you love yourself? 
I know they might try to conquer. We gonna fight the fight. Oh, God, I by day and watch I by night. I pray you'll restore the people's sight. Jah, give I courage to fight the fight. We gonna fight the fight. I know they might try to conquer I. We gonna fight the fight. Oh, God, I by day and watch I by night. By day, oh, by night. I pray you'll restore your people's sight. Oh, conquer. Oh, conquer. Oh, conquer I. Oh, conquer I. Oh, conquer I. Oh, let them conquer I. Oh, conquer I. Oh, conquer I. Oh, conquer I. Yeah, in the morning sun. And that's again, Fight the Fight by Mortimer. Love him so much. Um, a couple of books to recommend to you. So... Uh, Now's Valley Contribution to Civilization by Anthony T. Bowder is going to be one of them. Dr. Joy DeGruy's Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome is going to be another one of them. And the last is The Iceman Inheritance by Michael Bradley. Uh. Could I recommend anything else? That would be a great place to start, you know? Like, there's some wonderful stuff in there. And just go to your spaces where your elders are, where people have been through similar things, and hear what they're saying. Honestly, go back and look at the history of Australopithecus and Neanderthals. You'll get what I'm talking about. I want to know what you guys think. Let me know in the comments, and if you're new here, Hit the like and subscribe button, hit that bell so you know whenever I post video, and I'll see you next time.